152. And uh, we're down here with uh, discovering the scope and live data collection. And by the way, I think there's a guest lecture next week. I'll uh, probably delay this if there is. I, I, in fact, let me check right now. I forgot to update the schedule, but I think it's on here. Uh, yep, so there will be no lecture next week in this class. This will have this event instead, a, uh, a lecture about how to set yourself apart as a great hire. And by the way, tomorrow, the next day, and the next day, I'm doing free workshops for Circle City Con online, and you can join them if you want. It's worth extra credit. Um, I'll be doing it early morning the next three days. So everyone's free to join that if they like. Circle City Con is in Indianapolis, but I told them I'm not going to travel there, but I'll do it remotely, and they went for that. So I'll just do it remotely like most of you are doing this class. Anyway, um, all right. VeloCon is happening today, but that's over. All right. So. Uh, let's talk about the chapters for today, which start here. So the scope. I mean, the first thing you have to do. Oh, good. Okay. The first thing you have to do is decide how big the problem is when you have an incident. Um, if it's something like malware, how far is it spread and all that story. So you gather your preliminary evidence and then determine a course of action. Your first action being, of course, containment, isolating that part of the network so it doesn't keep spreading. So you look at the original alert, see if you can figure out what it means. You may well understand it better, have more context, see more than the other person. See if your other detection systems picked it up uh, and gather the context as an investigator. You're going to think differently than the person that reported it who might be like a tech support person. Um, so you determine what other sources will help and decide what sources you can use. You want to find a source that you can get a fast answer out of, not something that's going to take a long time to analyze. First, find something that will easily give you initial answers because you're trying to find out how big the problem is and you want to do that quickly. Um, so uh, here's in malware, you look at artifacts it creates like files or registry keys, the Windows prefetch, which shows you all the programs that have been launched recently, um, browser history, and firewall logs that show you network connections. These are easily obtainable things that might quickly help you narrow down on what the problem is. Um, and also, you want independent sources because a lot of people attack a system and then they erase the logs and conceal their tracks. But on a network, you really can't conceal all the tracks. Even if they erase the if antivirus logs, there might be other artifacts on the system like the prefetch. And if, even if they manage to erase all that, you'll have the firewall logs on another device and so on. So you want to find multiple independent sources to get reliable conclusions. And that's the idea. Uh, so the attacker may be currently active, causing more damage, so you want to contain them. So you want to find a quick, a fast and effective detection method so you can find out which machines are compromised and then isolate them from the rest of the network that's not compromised. So you're deciding whether your action will help answer a question, if it'll do it quickly, and if you're following the evidence. It is very easy to make an assumption and operate from your assumption without ever questioning your assumption. And we'll have examples of that coming up. You really want to make sure you're following the evidence instead of just guessing and then wasting a lot of time on your guess that might just be wrong. So uh, you check multiple independent sources, consider the amount of effort, and uh, just see if you are tracking the earliest evidence of comp and most recent evidence of compromise. You want to have the time range complete and consider if you find something that is an emergency, even more than whatever you're first investigating that requires you to shift your focus to that. So here's some examples. Um, there's a data loss scenario. They have a large online retailer and customers say that they're getting spam after they sign up for your company. So it appears that somebody is harvesting emails from your company and using it to send spam. Or at least that's what customers are saying. So, of course, the customers might just be wrong. That's an option, so you can consider things. You might work with the customers, review their mail, but if you want to do that, you're sort of invading their privacy and you don't really know if what they show you is correct. Uh, a better way, probably, rather than trying to get more data out of the customers, is to try to reproduce the problem. You create fake customer accounts with unique addresses and then see if they get emails. So you make 64 random character usernames, so those are not going to be found anywhere else, and then you wait to see if those accounts are going to start getting email. So um, while, that, while you're waiting, you look for other places. Where is the customer data anyway? It turns out there's one internal database on a production server, and there's one external copy of the database used by a marketing firm. So those are the two places that they could be getting the emails from. So 
The customer database is a mainstream commercial product with a lot of features. It's huge. It has a ton of traffic. And the customer records are updated either by the website or by a phone call into the customer service department. So there's no other way of updating customer records. There are backups on-site and off-site. And the marketing firm gets its data at the end of every month. So this, these are all useful bits of information to track it down. So it's unlikely that the marketing firm is the source because people complain before the month has passed when it would get forwarded to the marketing term. So you can exclude that. Um, calling in by phone is unlikely because tapping a phone and listening to the audio call is pretty unproductive. That's an inefficient way to steal data. You want to steal millions of records at once from the whole database. So that's, again, not likely. Um, now, you can't really monitor the traffic on the net, uh, database because that's too much traffic. Um, but what you probably should do is just have a query that harvests the data you want. That's the whole principle of uh, targeted collection and live response. Uh, okay, good. Oh, thank you, Hema. Good. Tell me the job fair was good today, but the cybersecurity company didn't show up. That was probably NCC. Yeah, well, good. So here's some theories. You might have an insider leaking out the data. That might be true, but it's not immediately obvious how to test it. There might be malware on your website, like injected code that's stealing the email addresses. So to test that, you enter some more fake accounts directly on the database to see if they get caught. There might be somebody copying the backup tapes, so you add some fake accounts to the backups that are not in the real database, and now you have um, three different kinds of accounts. You've got ones made through the web form, ones directly in a database, and ones added only to the backup. And now you wait to see if they get any spam. And it turns out that the first set of fake accounts get spam, the ones you made with the web account, and the ones manually entered in the database get spam, but the ones in the backup do not get spam. So this strongly suggests that the website is not the problem, it is the database itself. Someone is harvesting emails from the database. So this is how you do it. You know, this is the way all troubleshooting works. An investigation works the same way. You somehow split the problem in half and say, is it this or is that? And then you do an experiment. Now you've narrowed it. So now you've isolated. You know which part of your system is the problem. Somebody is getting onto your database. So now you've got theories. There might be malware on the server, or somebody is connecting over the network to run queries on a database. So um, if you want to monitor the queries, you could do it with packet captures, but this is really kind of pointless these days because not only is there so much traffic, but also everything is encrypted these days, so it's really hard to do. What's much better is to just use query monitoring and logging on the database server. So create some more fake accounts, find out where the data is stored, scan through logs to see what's normal, and you don't see any queries or stored procedures that perform a bulk export on a daily basis. So two weeks later, the new accounts get spam. So you now you create the query logs from accounts created around the spam time for the customer email, and you find a query that gets a whole bunch of emails within a date range. So somebody has run this query, which did harvest a lot of emails, and that may be the culprit. So you know when the query was executed. Now you can find out where it came from, from the log. So now you know who executed that query. And uh, you can interview that person in a graphics art and find out that they did not do that and they don't normally, all right. So now you have leads. There's evidence to support complaints. The customers are not lying. There really is somebody stealing the emails. You have a two-week cycle of data theft. Um, the queries are made over the network from a desktop computer in a graphics art department, so, and using credentials from that person. So here's some actions. Go to the graph desktop machine and collect a live response, forensic image of memory and hard drive. You want to do a thorough examination of this machine because it's the source of the problem, and it may have malware and other evidence on it. Then you interview the user and find out basic facts. Is there anything funny about the machine? Have they been, has somebody else been using it? Is it left on all the time? Basic facts. And then database server, collect a live response which will be running a script to list what you can, preserve database logs and query logs and application logs. You do not want to do a RAM dump or a hard drive dump because both of those are prohibitively large. So now on the workstation, you find malware, persistent malware with a remote shell so somebody can launch processes remotely connected from a foreign IP and it's been there for two years. So you're never going to be able to figure out how they got in because all that evidence is long gone. But now you know this machine is under hostile control and uh, you know the IP address it comes from for what that's worth. So now you, can, now you want to use 
a um, machine to see if they took over other machines too. Now that you've found the malware, you get some indicators of compromise and you put it in an investigative tool like Velociraptor that can check all the machines to see if other machines have been infected the same way and check your firewall logs to see if any other machines are connecting to that IP address. Those, those would be ways to see how big and bad the problem is. So um, that's now you're making real progress here. So here's what could go wrong in scoping. If you had complaints from customers and now you search every computer to see if there are copies of the data on computers in your, because you think, I guess you're thinking insider is stealing it and uh, see if you a copy of the data on the workstations, the problem is there's no reason to believe that the stolen data was ever stored on the company servers, on the workstations. So you're looking for something that probably isn't there. Um, and there's also no evidence that it's stolen all at once in a large file. So this is the kind of foolish thing. You've chosen a foolish path that takes a lot of work and has a low chance of success. That's the wrong direction to go. Uh, another way you can go is focus on insiders. You think somebody in your company is stealing emails and selling them or something, so now you're gonna find profiles of your employees, look at personnel files, do background checks, surveillance software, and all this jazz, uh, hunting for insiders. This is extremely common. People get paranoid, they blame their employees, and then they start uh, witch hunting to find a bad employee. Problem is this, makes everybody angry, it lowers their morale, they feel bad, and also you're, it's a large effort, and again, a small chance of success, it's not enormously likely that it's an insider. You don't have enough evidence here to justify that direction. You'd have to have much clearer evidence that it's really an insider. So another unwise path, you're determined if it's on the database server, then analyze everything on the database server, but the problem is, of course, the RAM is too big, the network traffic is too big, and the hard drive is too big, so you're gonna have a huge job and uh, that's not the most efficient way to find the problem. Once again, you've jumped to a conclusion and gone in the wrong direction. All right, so those are examples of ways things can go wrong. So here's another one. Um, you have an automated clearinghouse and they had a big transfer leave to an account that was never used before. That was flagged by their fraud prevention system. So the CFO, the chief financial officer, is transferring this from their account, but he says he never authorized it. So. If you use the CFO's online banking account, you know the amount, you know when it happened, you know the source IP address, which is inside your company, which is your company's public IP address. So you look at the firewall, examine that first, looking at the logs would be clear. Um, maybe you should examine the CFO's laptop computer, uh, or maybe there are other computers involved. These are things to think about. So look at the firewall logs and see who logged in prior to that. Two computers logged in, making connections in this time range from two IPs. One is the CFO's IP and the other is different. So researching, uh, then you, so what you do is gather complete forensic evidence from a CFO's computer. So make sure you preserve the evidence because it's being lost and then track down the other IP address and find out if you have a second computer performing the attack. You look at a MAC address from it and it turns out the MAC address is the CFO's laptop. So this machine had two different IP addresses in the time range which in fact you can tell by interviewing the CFO, he was in a meeting and then carried it to another room and connected to the wireless network. So that's why the same machine had two IP addresses. It's the same machine, but he just moved from one part of the company to another. All right, and he says he didn't initiate the transfer and he doesn't know anything about it. All right, so firewall logs show uh, there were connections from that computer to the bank, but there were no other connections. The CFO denies that he requested the transfer. Uh, so you have all the data you want, live response data, memory, and hard drive images of this one computer, which is the one that did it. So here's theories. Maybe somebody entered their office and used his computer. Uh, maybe there's undetected malware and somebody's remote controlling his computer. Um, you, could, you can check these. You can check security cameras to see if there's evidence of somebody else going in the office. And of course, you can check for the forensic evidence to see if there's a remote shell on the machine. Now, it turns out the office is clearly visible and it's unlikely that somebody's sneaking in there but the computer does have a recently installed persistent executable and when you send it to a third party analysis site like VirusTotal, it is malware, the Zeus banking malware, which gives you um, a remote control of a machine, I imagine. So uh, now you do a complete forensic examination, inspect every computer at your company again with something like Velociraptor to see if anybody else is infected with the same stuff. Look at your firewall logs to see if anybody else is communicating to any IP addresses the malware goes to, the usual stuff to see how big the problem is, and now you don't have any. All right, so that's, that's one way to go. So that's a reasonable investigation process. 
Now here's mistakes you can make. This is another fairly common one. I don't know how many people still believe this, but maybe eight years ago, a lot of people believed that antivirus was really good. And if you run antivirus, there's no malware in your machine. It's totally clean. This was a common belief. It's totally wrong, but people believe that. So if you believe that, there's no antivirus, no IDS alerts, therefore nobody's remote controlling our machines, that means the issue must be at the bank. So yell at the bank and tell the bank they have to stop letting people steal your money. Um, that's one way to go. The problem is you haven't validated this. You have assumed that your network is clean, which you have no reason to believe. And of course, now you've made it someone else's problem and the bank probably is not gonna do anything and you're gonna be waiting for them to do something. You've, uh, you've sort of cut yourself out of productive action here and you didn't have enough evidence to say the problem is at the bank. So this is again a assumption leading you down an unproductive alley. And here's another one. Um, the CEO, CEO believes that the security measures prevent malware, therefore the CFO must have betrayed you. So he wants you to investigate the CFO as an insider threat and find out why they are lying to you and stealing data. And there's various problems here. Um, one thing is, of course, that the security measures are not perfect. They do not mean nobody's in your network. And here's one I'm really glad to see. You're not a real detective, a human detective. You're an incident response person. You do not have the skill to do an investigation of a human. That's really someone else. That should go to a real detective if you're going to do that. Um, all right. So anyway, let's take a look at some cahoots. And that last point is very good. It is That is actually in, you take your CISSP or other certifications, that is one of the requirements, one of the ethics requirements, is you do not try to do something you're not qualified to do. You say, you know when to say, I don't know about that, you need to hire another contractor to do that. That's a fundamental rule of ethics. All right, so this is 152, chapter six, I believe. Let's take a look. It is. All right, good. seconds. I guess that's it. All right, so Coke hires you to perform IR and they're sure Pepsi did it. So what should you do? alternative theories, you don't start an investigation by assuming you know who the bad guy is. That's, unless, that's generally foolish. First, you have to inspect the evidence without starting with a foolish assumption like that. Anyway. All right. Mint is hacked, and customers are downloading infected files. This really happened. So what should you do? Mint Linux got hacked and people trojan their uh, ISOs. Right, this is an emergency. You need to stop the downloads. 
first, so you do not continue to harm customers before you do more investigation. All right. All right, so your database server shows suspicious queries and the image, the administrator wants to image the SAN. What should you do? Yeah, try other evidence because a storage area network is huge. Imaging that is a huge job and analyzing the image is a huge job. You need to find something better, like a log file you can use. All right, your CEO demands that you hack the attacker back. Now what should you do? Quit. I'm kind of disturbed by this referring to black hats, you know. That will make you guilty. You'll be participating in a conspiracy to commit a crime. You just quit. When you're ordered to commit an illegal act, you quit. That's, uh, you can get another job unless you enjoy spending time in jail. So anyway, this by the way, all these things happen. I've been ordered to do illegal things. Okay, again, I quit. Then they changed their mind and decided not to do it. But anyway, it's, um, it's fairly common that people get angry and order their staff to do illegal things. Yep, this is uh, not Kirk. Yeah, I guess not Kirk wins pretty often, but they never told me who they are. What's that? Forbidden Kirk. That could be hard to tell. Anyway, oh, that's what that means? Okay. Anyway, I don't know who E40 is or not Kirk, but Judah sounds like a real name, so Judah will get points. The others will have to come out of the closet if they want their points. Anyway, so let's go on to the next bit, which is live data collection, which is the main technique you use for incident response. So the point is to preserve the evidence and also collect useful information quickly. I was just hearing, listening to VeloCon today, the Velociraptor Con, and this guy said all he ever does is the SANS triage. If you use Velociraptor, which we'll use later, there's a SANS triage, there's a couple of them, but SANS is one of them, that just takes the stuff SANS recommends, which is just a listing of all the processes, a listing of all the files, all the registry keys, the, uh, and it, you know, about a dozen things, just standard things you take off Windows machine. And he says, I've never had to use anything but that, just the standard collection of everything. That's, that's a pretty good list of stuff that is a pretty good fingerprint of everything going on in that box. You can make custom queries to do specific things, but he finds that that is enough for everything he does. So anyway, um, now you want, when you're collecting this, you don't want to harm the system, you don't want to change it much, and you don't want to burden it so much that you cause crashes and in greater up business. You want your collection to be uh, have a small fingerprint. So, a footprint, they call it. So, um, consider, is the, the volatile evidence contain information that you're not going to get elsewhere? <coughs> is it going to burden the system too much? If the number of affected systems is large, which it usually is, or potentially, then you can't do duplication on all of them. So, forensic duplication is not your first move. Um, and you typically don't want it because it takes too long. And also, you may have legal considerations. If you really are planning to go to court and prosecute somebody, then you probably do need to do a forensic duplication of the infected disk so you have all the evidence. Whereas if you're just trying to find out what happened and fix it, then the log files and other information is probably enough. So make sure you test your live response process on a similar system to make sure that it works and that it doesn't crash the system or burden it too much. Oh, oh Judah has told me, okay, you weren't going to get your points either because your name is not, in fact, Judah. But now I've got it. Okay, good. <laughs> All right. Good. Anyway. So, uh, all right. So consider if your system can't is sensitive to performance and make sure you have all the approval you need because your investigation may do some harm. Another thing I heard at the VeloCon, this guy said, when I'm pushing an agent to a machine, I rename the agent to... Um, an innocent Windows process, um, the one that runs all the services in the background, the name I forget. Service host. Service host. Service host.exe. Because you already have 10 of those running, so they won't notice the others. See, otherwise people will notice I'm running this strange thing and cancel it because they're pretty smart and I don't want them to. So he's pushing agents out to machines and he doesn't want developers to notice it. So anyway, um, all right. 
So all live response changes the system. It's not as perfect as the old static disk image. You are modifying the image you're investigating, but you just get used to that, quit worrying about it. You minimize changes, but you don't totally eliminate them. And now you'll have to, when you're evidence, some of that evidence is going to be from the system, and some of it is going to be from your inspection tools, and you have to be able to tell the difference. So you can use, you can just write your own script in MS-DOS or PowerShell or Perl or anything else that you can available. You can write your own script, that's fine. People use specialized live response products too, and the main one we're going to use is Velociraptor. Like I say, Velociraptor has a whole bunch of prepared scripts that have, gather the evidence you need, and you don't need to bother writing your own scripts. And it handles a lot of other issues for you, like communicating with all the machines and collecting all the data as it comes back asynchronously and organizing it for you. So consider if your tool is generally accepted. Does it address the common operating systems? If you're going to use operating system commands, you should not use the commands on the system. You should bring in your own copy of those commands because the commands on the system might have been compromised. So if you're going to run net stat and net user and stuff, you don't know that the net command on that system is trusted. So you're, it should be from a trusted copy of those commands. So um, all right, uh, how long does it take? You typically don't want to spend more than an hour collecting data. And make sure you, you get output that you can easily understand. So you clearly want the running state of the system, network connections and running processes, listings of files and logs. These are obviously things you're going to need to collect essentially all the time. And some people always connect everything, entire RAM contents, entire hard disk images. But this is sort of crazy because that's weeks of effort to analyze that. And uh, that's not the most efficient way to get to the problem of an incident, usually. So here's what you want, the system time and date, including the time zone, which is important if you have multiple locations, the operating system, uh, basic information like memory capacity, hard drives, and so on, services, especially anything that launches automatically on boot up because malware is usually persistent and it automatically launches and you will be there. Uh, automatically scheduled tasks, local accounts, group membership. Is there any software Yes, there are a few software packages. We'll talk about Mandiant Redline is one, and Velociraptor is the one I recommend. Velociraptor has like the can. The, if you do the SANS triage, it'll do all this. Velociraptor is free? Yes, it's free and open source. Yeah, Velociraptor is why we're using it. It's also very good, very popular. So then you want your network interface details, of course, all the information about the network connections. Um, then you want drivers, files, running processes, user login history, the standard system logs, list of all the software, uh, application logs like web browser and antivirus, and a full listing of all the files with timestamps. There's just the standard stuff you'll want. And so that's, that's the stuff you'd want from a live analysis, is what you typically collect. Now, if you do want to collect all the RAM, you're going to need a tool to do that. Um, this is not part of live response typically, but you might need it if you really want to have all the evidence off that machine. You'd want all the RAM and a hard drive. So um, if you're going to do this, whatever system you use, make sure you test it. You know how fast it is and how large the output is, and therefore consider problems. Like if there's a broken USB port so you can't plug in a USB drive to put the data on, or a broken network card, or a locked screen, these are things that might prevent you from getting data. So the system you're examining might be infected with malware. Your copy of the data might include malware. And any credentials you use to log in may be compromised because that machine might be currently sending every data on it off to the bad guys. So be aware of that. You should not just uh, log in with a real meaningful account. So document what you do. Um, treat the system as hot. Don't interact with it casually. Make a plan and carefully control what you do with the system. Use the tools that have minimum impact, so you don't use GUI-based tools. It's much better to use command line tools. They have a slower footprint. Um, and make sure you keep a complete checksum of whatever you put out, like an MD5 hash, so you can make sure that copies of it are accurate. So um, here was a, I went and found a website where they compared these to see a comparison of acquisition software. And I was, the, the yeah. Checksum is the, the checksum of the files that you pull on. Checksum is what? You, you want to copy the checksum of the files in the system? Uh, checksum of whatever evidence you collect. Like you might have a big file, just so you know if you make an accurate copy of it later. Yeah. Yeah. 
And so here's a lot of popular tools. FTK Imager is the most popular, the one I've always used. It's been around forever. Belgasoft makes an imager. There's Dump It, Windows Memory Reader, ProDiscover, Memorize. These are all tools that can copy the RAM from Windows System and sometimes other operating systems. And it turns out they're very different in RAM usage. And the standard, which is the only one I've ever used much, is FTK Imager, and it's the worst. It's been the standard for many years. Maybe it was sloppily written because it's old. The Belkasoft one is much better. Anyway, so um, it uses a number of DILs too, um, keys and DILs. FTK Imager uses a lot of keys and DILs. Some of the others use much less. So FTK Imager, even though it's commonly the standard, um, is pretty messy. Now, someone I see a comment here, autopsy. Autopsy does not collect data. All autopsy does is analyze data once you collect it. So first, you'd have to use FTK Imager or something to get it, and then you put it in autopsy to analyze it. So here's the results. You know, FTK Imager is big. These others are much better. Belkasoft RAM capture is about the best. Uh, maybe Dump It is pretty good, too. So I started using Belkasoft after I saw this paper. <laughs> anyway, um, all right, so here's the recommended procedure. Automate everything is good, so you do exactly a consistent thing. Um, collect data in order of volatility, which means in practice the RAM first, then the hard drive, um, because the RAM is changing. Then, yeah? So the FTK imager, so it use a lot of memory? So yeah, it uses a lot of memory and a lot of DILs. So therefore, well, therefore, it's erasing more of the evidence. It's using more of the resources on the computer. In fact, in practice, everybody's been using it for years, if not decades, everybody I know. So we've just gotten used to it. But I guess it would be better to use Belkasoft. Um, and so uh, remember what you've got is evidence here. So you're going to have to have an evidence tag and a chain of custody and a checksum because you may need to make copies of this and you may need to take it and prove that it's authentic. Um, and remember, anything you put on that machine is lost to the attackers. So you should not use um, anything on there. Uh, your machine that is being used to collect evidence should not have any other valuable data on it. Because any, so yeah. So you even run MTK, uh, run the checksum on that machine? The FTK does make a checksum, yeah. No, but so you even run the uh, MTK5, uh, MTK5 uh, checksum on the system? Because, you know, the, other, the, the, the bad guys there, they, they kind of know. Well, yeah, I mean, it's gonna, they're going to know you made an image. I mean, uh, but the main thing you're worrying about here is you don't want to bring in uh, passwords or log files you collected or evidence or anything. You only want to connect like a hard drive that contains, say, uh, your tools and enough room to store the evidence, nothing else. In fact, there's a recommended procedure here. Anyway, say any credentials you use are compromised, so you should use a special account just for this purpose or an account that uses a single, you can only log in once. Uh, don't do anything unnecessary that will harm the evidence more than you have to. For example, um, as copying the live response tool to the system or storing the evidence on the system. Those are just erasing parts of the hard drive you didn't need to erase and using RAM you didn't need to use. So use a network share or movable media and don't perform analysis on the suspect computer. You analyze on another machine. Um, all right. And here's some horror procedures. People have copied a live response toolkit to the system, save the collected data back to the same system, including a full RAM dump. So they're overriding a lot of evidence with their collection procedure. This is an unwise procedure. Another one's remotely log in with the domain administrator account and run tools, and therefore you're exposing your domain administrator accounts to a compromised system. And this is the old-fashioned technique that was standard until about 10 years ago. Pull out the plug, image the hard drive, forget about RAM. That's the old-fashioned technique, but that is not appropriate for incident response because the evidence you need is most likely in RAM. So good methods. For example, have a network share on a dedicated file server with throwaway credentials. Have two folders, a read-only folder containing all the kit you're going to use so it can't be modified, and a writable folder to store the data. That's a good, clean way to do it. All right, so you browse to the share, you run the live response system directly from the share and send the output to the share, and now you've got a complete connection. Uh, you, now you've got a good image you can save and analyze later with doing the minimum amount of damage to the system. So you air gap the evidence server, um, and watch, every, your, your evidence server should not be connected to the internet. It should be, and any access to it should be logged and recorded, so you can say, I made sure the evidence was not being modified, and automating processes is very good. And of course, when you do run live response software, it needs administrative credentials to copy all the RAM. 
So some computers cannot connect external media. So um, you might connect to CD-ROM, DVD, network share, or set up an encrypted tunnel to get data off the machine. Especially um, IoT devices may very well not be easy to uh, get, and cell phones and such. And you might have a funny operating system. Internet of Things, you know, like a GPS device, uh, a smart thermostat. These things may well not be connected to your usual infrastructure and have the usual ports. So you might have a screwy OS that you don't, not, that you don't have tools, your normal tools won't run, so now you're gonna to have to perform a manual live response. You'll have to take whatever commands are right for that OS and figure out how to get the data off it. Um, so if you do that, you create a checklist of what you want, um, research it, test it on another system if possible, and then you manually perform those steps. And I might have probably mentioned this in the forensics class, so maybe not this one. There is police that have gotten cell phones from crime scenes and they have just taken a camera and taken photographs of the screen and paged through the messages. Now that is not a perfect procedure, but it is evidence. They didn't get all the evidence, but they got evidence that was really there. You know, the real evidence is the human testifying in court. So even if all you can do is something sleazy like that, that's, that's something. Um, but you can, for instant response, you'd like to do better than that. All right, so if you automate it, you're more likely to be consistent and not make errors. And it also means that bad guys can't learn anything from your process because it's always the same. So having an automated process is the best procedure and it's usually pretty easy for a corporate job because they all have the same operating system and software and so you can, you can prepare a plan that will work. Anyway, let's try another Kahoot. 152.7a, here it is. Start. It's messing with me. There we go. All right. Somebody has this hostile attitude towards Kirk. Huh? What's that? Well, I don't know. All right. I think this might be enough. So the suspect reinstalled the operating system to hide evidence. So what should you collect? You need a hard disk image so you can recover deleted files. This really happened in one of the cases my environment teachers told me about. The uh, suspect sold their computer to an attorney who then reinstalled the operating system. And he said, that's all right, I want it anyway. And then they settled the case because they knew they were hosed. They thought reinstalling the operating system would erase all the data, but it doesn't. It only erases a small part of the data. You can still get the rest from the hard disk image. So that's, if you erase, you can forensically erase a disk, but reinstalling the OS does not do that. But if you turn on a couple times, you, 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 uh, you know, the, the the hot disk will get erased, right? No. Um, the problem, your OS might be like 20 gigs and your hard drive might be 500 gigs. So, so every time you, 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 you boot up, uh, the, the operating system writes some data on the hot disk. It does. Every time you boot up, it writes data, but that's only a few log entries. It's really small. No, if you, there's data on your drive from a really long time ago. The only thing that erases the drive is really writing over the whole drive, which takes hours. You can do it with uh, built-in commands, disk part, 
select disk and clean all, or you can get a forensic tool like Eraser. But um, if you just save files on it and use it normally, a lot of that drive is not being erased, not for a long time. The, only the part you use is getting erased. And reinstalling the OS doesn't do much at all. The OS is not that big. Filling the whole thing with like MP3s and then erasing them and filling the whole thing again with MP3s, that would get a lot of it. That's essentially what these erased, uh, these cleaning tools do. They fill the whole thing. Yeah, um, it, about half the time, solid state drives work the same as magnetic drives, that a, a block is not erased until you use it. And so the part that you haven't used recently contains leftover old files. But about half the time, um, SSDs perform a process called garbage collection, where they automatically empty the part files after you delete them. And then you really cannot recover much uh, deleted stuff, because it automatically deletes it about 10 seconds after you delete it. That's to make the SSD more efficient. But that requires that you have up-to-date driver software and an up-to-date operating system that has the trim function. So every time you delete a file, it tells the SSD controller, this file has been deleted, you can collect the garbage. If you don't have everything up-to-date, then the SSD doesn't know when files are deleted, and it cannot do bar garbage collection. And therefore, supposedly, it'll be lower performance slower to read and write because you'll try to save a file and we'll say, wait, before you save it, I have to clean up some blocks to make room for it. That's, that's, that's the difference. Yeah, sure. All right. So you find a few infected, you need to find a few infected machines on a large network. This is, of course, very common. That's a live response, that's just what it's for. You can, it's a script that collects enough useful information to detect the infection, and, and you can deploy it over many machines. All right. All right, you find child pornography. Now what should you do? None of this. Your investigation is over. You have to give everything to the FBI and not touch it again. Whatever you were doing, forget it. It doesn't matter anymore. This stuff is like radioactive. It's a huge felony. Even looking at it as a felony, even possessing it as a felony, all your evidence goes to them and you never see it again. You, you've been trumped. <laughs> you've, uh, this, is, this is a wild card that overrides your other considerations. <laughs> so you hand that over to the Ex National Center for Exploitation of Children, which is part of the FBI, and it's out of your hands. <laughs> All right. Your investigation is going to go to court, so you need complete evidence, so what should you collect? More than one of these, typically all the RAM and the hard disk. And then you make a, a, you store the original evidence in a safe and you take copies of that and you give one copy of it to the defense and one copy to the prosecution and they check the MD5 hash so it's perfect and then they both hire examiners to hunt through that and then you battle it out in court. That you need to collect all the evidence and you need to give it all to the other side so you can battle it out in court. All right, so a jealous husband wants evidence from his wife's laptop. So what should you do? This, of course, happened to one of my students. Most of these are true stories. Yeah, try none of this. He cannot authorize you inspecting her device. She has her rights. You would need her permission to investigate her device or if you're the police, you would need a search warrant. If you do that, she can sue you. You're violating her rights. So, so 
I had a student get this request and then he called me and I said, don't do it. He said, that's what I thought. I wasn't sure. So what I did was I just quoted a really high price and he went away. And I said, well, that'll do. <laughs> that may not be the perfect answer, but at least you didn't do it. So, all right. And this, of course, comes up all the time. People think somebody's cheating on them. They want to know who have they been chatting with, who have they been sending emails to. This is really common. Okay, let's see. Judah is one price. And I know who, who Lua Eli is. And uh, Hina L, good. This time, I know who all the people are. So they get their points. All right. So it's uh, about 7. Let's take a break until 7.10, and then I'll do the next bit of this lecture and demonstrate some stuff after that.